Um, welcome to the session on communications and engagement. So I'm the chair. This is a session that's really, really hard and super, super important to make sure that our research is ethical, relevant and responsive. So I'm an associate professor at Oxford University. My name is Peg Yong Chia. I'm a bioethicist and community engagement practitioner based at the Mahidol Oxford Tropical Medicine Research Unit here in, in Bangkok. I'm also a member of the SONA Global Web Network, which is a network of social scientists working on infectious diseases threats, uh, including COVID. We currently are working on engagement around COVID studies and also have a project on the socioeconomic uh, impact of uh, COVID. So in this session, um, we have um, uh, Deborah Nirienda, uh, who's the rapporteur. Deborah is the postdoctoral si social scientist, work based in Malawi Welcome Trust Unit. Her research interests are in community engagement, bioethics, behavior change, and behavior change interventions. There will be four speakers. I won't introduce everyone yet, but in turn, um, as they come on to speak. So as I said, we've got four. And without further ado, I shall invite um, Jamie Betson as his first speaker. So Jamie is an international development consultant specializing in community engagement, in, including uh, the role of community engagement within the context of disease response. Jamie has also worked in, for several years in development, uh, practicing, in, practicing in countries uh, in Africa and Asia. His COVID work is focused on risk communication and community engagement. Jamie, over to you, please. Thank you very much. And uh, hello everyone from Seattle. Very early morning here in Seattle. Um, you'll see the sun coming up behind me as I'm talking, hopefully. Um, five minutes, so I'm gonna, gonna keep this tight. I, I'd like to, to, to thank everyone for, um, for joining and, and for, for the invitation. Uh, I'll start by saying that um, I'm not strictly a researcher, I'm kind of research ad adjacent, but I've worked for the last several years on promoting community engagement and risk communication and how it intersects with the broader development and humanitarian architecture. So I just want to give a little bit of a, a, a context for, for where I'm coming from. Um, I mainly come from as a development practitioner background, including being in Sierra Leone when, when the Ebola outbreak began. And as everyone can appreciate, just as we're seeing with the COVID-19 outbreak, the Ebola outbreak kind of highlighted the range of issues to do with working with communities that, that um, were always existent, but were not getting the attention they deserved, including the role and prioritization of community engagement, the centrality of communication of communities in all responses, the capacity of communities to take positive action, and of course, the role of social science research and how it connects to implementation policy and, and real-time data collection and, and uh, interpretation. So that generated a significant amount of energy, as everyone knows, and, and we're seeing a similar thing happening again. From my side, and just to give a bit of frame for what I'm gonna talk about, um, that resulted in working with UNICEF to generate minimum quality standards uh, and indicators for community engagement, which is recently launched. And the idea of that is, is um, to provide guidance and associated tools for creating a common understanding for community engagement for practitioners, researchers, uh, governments, um, trying to establish some kind of common language that we were on the same page when we're talking about community engagement, because we see such a variety of spectrum of, of how that's understood within different contexts. Secondly, I've been working on a project for the Gates Foundation for several years that's premised on the idea of bringing together social science, uh, scientists, epidemiologists, mathematical modelers, practitioners around um, a shared goal of retrospective modeling of community engagement data um, from, from the outbreak in Sierra Leone, but also to consider broad issues of collaboration and trying to demonstrate the effectiveness of community engagement um, and finding uh, novel ways of doing this. But the key is like trying to bring a multidisciplinary effort towards this. So the priorities coming from that, and then I'll, I'll jump to the questions that ensuring communities are, are included and listened to, um, not just the impacts of disease, um, but also what actions are communities taking that are positive that can inform how we how we uh, implement a response, um, ensuring the mechanisms and structures are in place to facilitate an, in, uh, an enabling environment for community engagement, broadening our horizons about what social science and, and community engagement data can be captured and how, um, advocating for funders and multilaterals to better understand, and and then you know ultimately we need to stop transmission and reduce the number of deaths. So any work that 
goes towards that is is um, a real focus of what how we translate research into implementation. So just jumping into the three questions, um, how COVID-19 will shape social life. Um, because of the nature of COVID-19, um, the nature of transmission, both what we know and what we don't know, um, that practice and messaging and policy making is going to be rapidly changing um, in real time. It makes it incredibly difficult for communities to determine what works in taking action to protect themselves. Um, but they're dynamic and they will find or are finding novel solutions to some of these impacts and understanding that process is, is essential. Um, needs that are unmet due to the economic and health benefits are going to impact the extent to which individuals and communities are willing to take action to prevent or able to take action to prevent transmission and understanding that's important. Um, frontline workers uh, are both essential, but they're also some of the most vulnerable economically. So um, they're experiencing both sides of the response. So that has a real uh, impact on the social fabric. Um, and they're trusted, they understand the issues. And, and what we've seen in several outbreaks is that there's not enough emphasis on, on understanding the role of frontline workers. And I, and I think that's, that's something to really take into consideration. And also just from the, the community, if we, if we consider the, the, the emergency response and humanitarian community, um, it's putting significant strains on the organizational and, and coordination and funding mechanisms of that broader community that, that I would say we're all part of. And, and that's, that's an essential part to take into consideration. Challenges for research, and I said I'm not strictly a researcher, but I'm, I'm trying to manage research projects um, and, and, and create space for, for the researchers that I work with. Um, it's been a disruptor for everyone, um, researchers and governments, COVID-19. Um, a challenge is going to be to, to develop and or strengthen the links between research, policy and implementation amongst all of those groups when everyone's been pulled in different directions now um, in terms of prioritization. Everyone's been taken off their previous work and, and put onto COVID. Um, all those other institutional mechanisms we're trying to put in place are, are going to be um, stretched by that. Finding common ground on multidisciplinary efforts. Um, for example, um, bringing together social science and epidemiologists and I'm being asked to wrap up. So I'm just going to jump to the last, uh, the last section on research funders. Um, they need to support um, advocating for the importance of social science, promoting coordination and partnership across funding agencies to avoid duplication. Collaboration should be incentivized by funders, meaning collaboration from start to finish, designing research questions with communities and making sure that research questions include operational elements. Um, promoting research that understands not only the impacts, but also community actions, positive community actions, and how these can be scaled up or replicated. And then I'll wrap up by just, you know, funders should be promoting uh, innovation where possible, because this provides us with an opportunity amongst everything to, to innovate and, and to start working together in a, in a, in a, in a more complementary way. I'll wrap up there. Thank you. Heck, I think you're uh, you're muted. Rookie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Um, and so we won't be taking questions yet. We'll save the questions to the discussion session. I'll move swiftly on to Otwin Wren, who will go, um, start the next talk. And please, um, participants, you can use the chat function to send your questions in the meantime. All right, so the next speaker is um, Otwin Wren, who's a sociologist and scientific director at the International Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam near Berlin, Germany, and a professor for environmental sociology and technology assessment at University of Stuttgart. Otwin, the floor is yours, please. I can't start my video right now. I think somebody else has to do that. But I would welcome everyone. Thank you very much now yeah, for inviting me. I'm sitting here in front of one of the wonderful lakes in Potsdam, but that's not real, that's fake. And that is my first point in terms of risk communication in the COVID-19 crisis. Wrong information kills. 
And I think that's a very important element. Communication is not a luxury thing that we can attach to policymaking. It's one of the crucial points because we have seen in the crisis that fake news, wrong information has killed people, has not been able to save people as much as possible. And so communication is a very focal part of any response to a crisis. My second point is that context matters. I think there's not one communication recipe book that we can use all over the world. We have to see that all communication is embedded in a context, a social, political. Trust in authorities are a very major element in this. The way that the political regime is being set up and how it's being legitimized, all of that has a major impact on whether, for example, uh, information is being believed or is being complied to. So I think it's very important in terms of our research to make sure that we understand the context in which communication takes place. Number three is that it is very important also to think about semantics. Semantics do matter. I think it was a major mistake to call what we have uh, named physical distancing the way it is called. We, we want, sorry, it was called social distancing. Um, and I think we should have used the word physical distancing. Um, so what we do right now is social uh, interaction while we are physically distant. And uh, this is just one example. We have a whole set of uh, phrases that we've used in the crisis uh, that have uh, given rise to a lot of concerns. And it's only because of semantics, not about the context and, and the content of it. Number four is that I think that was already echoed by Jamie, in terms of communication, we need to be very clear that we have very different audiences, even within a set culture. And there are people that are more privileged in terms of having the capability and capacities to deal with the crisis and others who don't. And we need to have very different types of communication for one group or the other. And it can be really counterproductive to mix these kind of messages for different audiences. So it's very important to think about psychologically what audiences say, but also socially and economically, because all of that and culturally too, all of that has a major impact on the way that it's being understood and that we are not opening a new front because we just have um, confronted the people with the wrong type of message. Number five is uh, we should be in terms of the corona crisis right now, but in the aftermath, to think about being better prepared also in terms of communication and set up preparatory work uh, forces with a kind of an including a governance approach, meaning that those who will receive the communication are part of the group that designs the communication. I think that the best way is a participatory way. We can't do this in the crisis because we don't have the time to do that. But after the crisis and before the crisis, this is a very important element of when a crisis comes up, we have already gone through an approval by uh, the uh, people who are addressed by communication and that they shape the kind and the way and also the phrases that are most important. And my last point is, and that is my point on research, which I was asked to do, I think what we really need to do is to have more transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary research. Interdisciplinary sense that communication science, social science, but also virology and others need to come together to bring the best type of message that we can deal and the best channels of conveying and transporting this message to the people. And transdisciplinary basically means that we also include knowledge that's outside of science, that are practical knowledge. And I think that's extremely important in the context of communication. We have a lot of good anecdotal and good uh, experiential knowledge that we need to include. So these are my six points. First, information kills. Secondly, context matters. Thirdly, semantics matter. Fourthly, consider different audiences and their needs. Fifthly, be prepared to set up a communication program, including the ones that you'd like address. And lastly, we need interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Artwin. That's a lot of information there and a lot of food for thought. <laughs> I'll ask you later about um, what do you think about some concrete examples. But um, thank you very much for moving from Pasdam in uh, Germany. Uh, let's go to, let's now go to Bangladesh. So I'd next like to welcome Sabina Faiz Rashid, Dean and Professor at the James Grant School of Public Health, Brack University, Bangladesh. Um, Sabina, ah. take us away. Okay, so I, I'm a medical anthropologist by training. I was trained at ANU in Australia and I oversee the School of Public Health. I've been there since 2004. So I'm gonna make about six core points. Um, some of, uh, so I'm gonna start with the Brack James B. Grant School of Public Health is running about 24 research assessments uh, during this um, COVID period because um, we inform policy, we inform government, we inform NGOs and service delivery. So some of it's rapid research, some of it's longer term over the last four or five months, tracking populations. So my points are that generally in public health, conventionally, we look at the, the approach to COVID has been a shutdown, lockdown mode, but which is very much an in, individual determinant uh, of risk and health. And working from, for a very long time in urban slums and if you work in informal settlements, um, you don't have, uh, the, the, the contextual realities are that the economics, the social spaces, are extremely difficult. So risk factors are broader than the individual. Uh, there's congested housing, there's communal latrines, there's communal water, and people are having to share spaces. So what um, our, uh, our colleague, the professor earlier said, is that we need to also think through messages that are relevant and sort of resonate with individuals who don't have the power or the structural sort of the systems against them that don't allow them to, to follow certain guidelines. like. Um, a distancing or washing your hands with soap when you can't afford soap because you can't afford food. So I think we really need to be clear when we talk about COVID that we need to expand the notion of risk. And when we look at marginalized and much more poorer populations, what are the largest structural social economic factors that impact on their ability to combat COVID? So moving beyond the biomedical model to allow for the reality of much larger macro micro factors that in, in, in fact, um, shape their lives. And I would argue for a community-centered model, which is trying to understand research, trying to understand their lives from a community-centric perspective. Usually research is very top-down. So the questions we ask, the assumptions we make, even the messaging we do, assumes a certain kind of decontextualized individual. And this was said earlier, people have completely different lives. I'm sitting at home on Zoom, participating in this webinar, someone who works in the informal sector, and remind, let me remind you in Bangladesh, 85% of people work in the informal sector, so they rely on daily wages. They have to go out there and work. So in some ways, they are vulnerable to risk for this, uh, for this virus. Another couple of points I wanted to make is we really need to look at a socially just model, which is everyone talks about social determinants of health. But I really think we also need to talk about the structural and social inequalities that plague development and health. Um, and that means that we really need to be a little bit reflective and allow different kinds of data to inform our research. And what is data, what is evidence? I think there's still a, a, a challenge here because surveys or certain kinds of disciplines dominate uh, the public health landscape and even in terms of decisions and interventions. I think you need many diverse disciplines that allow for ethnographies, qualitative research, political scientists, even historians to come together where you can have more nuanced perspectives, but allow you to look at the complexities of people's lives and they're trying to manage COVID, which then goes back to another point that many of the speakers alluded to, which is in our research we're finding, stigma is a huge issue, which means that it's leading to a lot of underreporting of signs and symptoms. So even in the communication messaging, we need to know how we frame isolation, quarantine, and it's not saying people don't need the information, it's about how do you contextualize it? So a couple of my key points are data is important, but we need to unpack what we value as data because I think there's a data hierarchy that informs policies, informs global policies and programs, and even at a national level. Final point is if we're going to look at designing programs during COVID post pandemic, um, we need to involve the communities. The very stakeholders that we talk about are often on the periphery as we tell them what we think they should do and what is best for them. I found with 25 years of working in Bangladesh, many 
are pragmatic and they know their own solutions. We only let them and allow them to mobilize. The final key points, because I've got a minute left, context matter, community-centric approaches in research, allowing for data that allows for nuanced, complex factors, sort of diverse disciplines that bring much more to, in terms of information, rich data to understand what's going on. And uh, finally, program design has to be community-centric. Let's reach out to the stakeholders who are and should be key decision makers. Right now, I would say globally and locally, we tell marginalized populations what to do. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina. Very, very, prof um, very, very wise words. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, right, so from Bangladesh, let's now move to Nairobi. So Nairobi, from Nairobi, uh, we have Rose Orenje who's joining us. She is the Director of Public Policy and Communications at the African Institute for Development Policy. She provides strategic leadership in the design and delivery of research, advocacy interventions relating to evidence uptake. The research revolves around studying key health system actors, in, including um, policy makers. Rose, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, again, I just go straight to the questions I was asked to talk about. So my research uh, largely focuses on understanding health systems uh, with the main um, interest of providing lessons for improving performance and, and service provision. And so I'm mostly um, studying policymakers, parliamentarians, um, technocrats, of course, researchers and their role in decision making, uh, mass media, uh, as well as the public. Um, I'm also, of course, besides research, I'm also uh, involved in designing and implementing uh, activities or programs that support increased use of research and other types of evidence in decision making. So if I may go to the first uh, question that I'm asked to respond to, which is how is COVID-19 shaping the social life of the communities that I study? I think the first thing that, I, that comes to mind is the fact that a lot of the policymakers, uh, researchers that I work with, are now mostly uh, captivated by, by COVID-19. And this means that other projects, other research that I'm doing, nobody's really paying a lot of attention to them. In fact, sometimes contacting them to talk about uh, stuff that is not COVID-19, you're almost not likely to get any attention. Uh, for instance, I think uh, between March and, and um, May, when COVID-19 became a big issue here in Kenya, for instance, you couldn't even get sessions to talk about anything else except COVID-19. And that has meant that a lot of the other programs are suffering within, within the health systems. Um, the good thing, though, is that uh, COVID-19 is pushing these uh, actors, these technocrats and decision makers to think about issues that they're often not prioritizing, issues of health financing. I think we see uh, governments, not just Kenya, but governments across the region now putting in uh, notable amounts of budgets to tackle COVID-19, which often healthcare budgets don't, are usually not that, that uh, prioritized. We are seeing a lot of focus on research and data and other evidence just for them to get a good sense of what decisions should they be making, which is good. We are also seeing a lot of increased priority for communities as critical actors, particularly in stemming the spread of, of the virus. So that is a really good thing. I think one of the, the, the things that is changing in the way um, my work and working with decision makers is the fact that a lot of them don't have supportive systems for them to be able to work virtually. And so for some of my ongoing work here in Kenya and Malawi, we've had to actually support provision of data bundles to be able to have online sessions and, 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 and uh, online meetings with, with decision makers because the government agencies in which they're sitting and working in are not providing them reliable data or internet connection for them to be able to continue with some of this work. I'm moving on to the second question, which, uh, which is uh, what are the challenges my research is encountering in, this, uh, in the next 12 months? I think data collection has become so difficult because you can't do you know, uh, face to face uh, data collection anymore. And so we are shifting to doing interviews online, doing online surveys for some of the work we are conducting to support decision making and again, mostly on COVID-19 for the ministries of health. And of course, these kinds of methods that we haven't used for, for some time mean that they're bringing a lot of quality challenges in the kind of data that we are, we are collecting. And so we need some time to keep learning how do we address this data challenges posed by doing phone interviews, having online conversations instead of face-to-face -face interviews or focus group discussions. Um, again, uh, many of the actors I'm working with are really hard to involve or engage substantively uh, using virtual platforms. 
largely again uh, because of the challenge of them having supportive mechanisms for them to work virtually but also that it's it's taking some time you know for for the ment mentality to shift from you know face to face meetings to actually doing things virtually and so for some of the work i'm doing for some of the research i'm doing we've actually had to just postpone uh, some of the activities because we are struggling to get uh, decision makers are struggling to get policy makers to actually engage substantively through online platforms. Um, the other thing that I would like to, to mention in terms of some of the challenges is uh, uh, the fact that uh, these, these, these actors are also interested in quick studies, you know, quick studies to, to respond to some of the issues that COVID-19 is bringing up. And yet it's, it's very well understood that health systems are, are so complex. And so when you think about the need for us to study longer term, get uh, understand um, complex issues, it, particularly to prepare health systems to effectively um, uh, tackle COVID-19, but also other future, uh, other future challenges or, or pandemics, we are not able to collect that kind of information because right now everyone is really keen on doing quick studies that provide evidence they need right now for them to address the ongoing challenges with COVID-19. And so that brings me to some of the things that I think um, funders may need to support researchers working in contexts uh, like the one, the one I'm working in and with the actors that I engage. I think one of them is to sustain funding for other non-COVID issues because yes, COVID is, is, is a pandemic right now, but there are other issues that very limited attention is being paid to. And this is obviously having an impact and we'll see that in the changing indicators, perhaps in the, in the, in the next periods of data collection. Um, the need to fund um, studies that uh, look at holistic system thinking uh, in terms of tackling pandemics, as opposed to just funding quick, um, very focused studies that are, do not give us a deeper and holistic view of the health system and how that needs to be transformed into adaptive and dynamic systems that are able to deal with future pandemics. Uh, there's also need particularly to support, uh, I think poor government to support their national funding mechanisms. I think a lot of governments have realized right now that they need to put in money to generate their own research, generate their own data, which have often been ignored. And so the need for funders to see ways of supporting and strengthening these national funding uh, systems and mechanisms, as well as uh, national and subnational knowledge systems, because right now uh, people in government are realizing they, they need information, they need data urgently, but they have ignored investing in their own national research systems and data systems. And so just realizing they don't have the information they actually need to make decisions as, 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 the, as the pandemic keeps evolving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Rose. Um, and thank you to, to all the um, speakers, Rose, Sabina, Otwin, and Jamie. So um, let's now open the floor up for questions. You may um, use the chat function um, on this, the platform, or you can raise your hand, either virtual hand, or you can wave if you're, oh no, your camera's off, so you can't wave. Um, right, so <laughs> let me kick off with the first question. I would like to ask the first question. Um, right, so this session is about community engagement and, and communications, right? Um, at the risk of being very, very unpopular. So these are ideals. We should embed community voices in research. We should involve communities in shaping our communication strategy, et cetera. Will, will you be able to, um, anyone, uh, give us a con some concrete examples of where that has been done and, and done uh, successfully? Um, it's open to everyone. So we're trying to do it in the Bangladesh context where there's so much stigma around COVID and we are trying to develop with BRAC, the largest NGO, we're planning this, um, where you're trying to I, I explain certain kinds of messaging because certain assumptions are made about stigma, certain assumptions are made about isolation. And it's about giving that information clearly that you're going into isolation for supportive care. Uh, I'll give you many examples because we work closely with the NGO sector where it's not idealistic to be community centric. In fact, a lot of projects that work well has had communities involved in the discussions. I remember a project, I mean, pre-COVID, you can say about COVID where an organization set up a health clinic for sex workers. 
No one used that clinic because no one had talked to them. When they went back and talked to them, uh, they were much more uh, uh, sensitized to the fact that the sex workers didn't want a clinic right near where they worked because that would identify them and stigmatize them as carriers of disease. Another example I'm saying is that we're looking at committees that inform and become the voice. So this is one of the recommendations we're making in a research project, which is you need to infor inform, um, involve informal drug sellers because 80% of the population go to pharmacists, uh, drug sellers. So how do we make them champions of the same communication messaging? I think a lot of these things are feasible and Bangladesh has a history of taking to scale uh, ORS to, to, to combat diarrhea, to manage immunization, to combat stigma against TB by actually involving communities. It, it's not unheard of. It's just that academia and development, in, and I speak for myself, we tend to be very top down. We're also extremely arrogant. We think we know best and we have the knowledge. So we're the knowledge bearers. And I think the problem is we need to sit back and listen. And that's why I think diverse research and diverse approaches are critical because we need to, you know, it's the basic values of empathy, respect, and understanding. If someone doesn't know what I need, I can't assume that they will know what I need, but we don't give that space. So when we talk about policymakers, it's very top down. Have we ever talked about the communities being in the policy table or having those conversations? So I actually disagree. It's not idealistic at all. I think there needs to be a commitment to change the way we think. And it is being done in our country, good or bad with challenges. So I think if there's a will and academics are interested, and researchers and development practitioners, it can be done. I think we just don't do it as much as we should. Yeah. Thank you, Sabina. Well said. Anyone else? I'm happy to jump in. Sorry, Audra, and after you. Okay, well, I just wanted to report that, uh, you know, uh, even in a crisis situation, I know that time is very crucial. And then we need to make sure that things are going quickly. Uh, so in that sense, we cannot have a big citizen participation program. But what happened, for example, here in Potsdam was that the uh, scientific institutions came together with neighborhood groups, and then they were visiting basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, groups of people who have been more disenfranchised uh, from, let's say, the mainstream communication channels to make sure that they will get the information, but also the services. <laughs> will be provided in the sense service on one hand, so for example, food or uh, refreshments or something else. Uh, but again, with also information, how you can protect yourself and, and what is fake news and what's not. I would like to point out, I know it's very good to, you know, to share everything and that, you know, every knowledge is relative, but at the same time, we had to fight very much with totally wrong assumptions about the virus. And, uh, and that it was very important that all the top scientists came top down and said, listen, this is total nonsense. You know, all these conspiracy theories are out there. It's nonsense. Don't believe them. And we have to be credible. And to be credible is also to provide service to the people through whom you preach. Uh, and that, I think, was a very important lesson, at least for us. Thank you. Um, Jamie. I yeah, and from my side, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Sabina. It's not idealistic at all. Um, what we have, though, is uh, this is where the nexus between the research and the implementation is, right? So there's the how and the what. So messaging is incredibly important, but once you develop the messages, once we understand it's, it's the how, how do we engage with communities in a structured and meaningful way? And often that gets left out. And even in the practitioner world, uh, which is one reason we develop standards, this gets this gets left off. So engagement has to be not just the, 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 the what, what we're going to talk about, but the how the process has to be structured from start to finish and invested in. And it's not, it's not cheap, but that's, that's how it can be done. So the, the example I have from, from um, Ebola was the idea of, of training multiple mobilizers, ensuring that they have a, a process of training, of data collection, of contributing to how that data is collected, how the research questions are put together and make sure that's done at community level. Um, it's never ideal because as Sabina was saying, it's often top down. We can't avoid that. That's the process we're in sometimes, but we can do everything in our, in our power to create the structures to involve the community. Um, and there are examples of that happening, but it, it, it needs that collaboration between those that, that, you know, implement and those that understand. And I'll put it to that. Um, right, thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see Rose's hand up. So I'll go to the next question. 
Um, this is from R M Miraji. Question to Sabina. Could you talk a little bit more of the hierarchy of data and how you remedy inequality there? Sabina, this is what this one's for you. Yeah. So, I mean, being a medical anthropologist and a critical medical anthropologist in a school of public health, I mean, I see it from my own trajectory in Bangladesh where anthropology or qualitative research or social sciences, sociology is seen as a series of quotes. And it's really <laughs> surveys and clinical data that informs what public health is about. And over the years, this is shifting. I mean, you're part of SONA Global and so am I. Um, there's much more realization that many things don't work because data has a hierarchy, at least in the public health world, of being epidemiologists, biostatisticians, right? Not picking on any of them. Some of my best colleagues and best friends are epidemiologists and biostatisticians, and they bring great knowledge. But I think the sooner we realize that when we're looking at a human being and we're trying to understand health, health is not just biomedical. It's social, it's mental, it's emotional, it's physical, which is spiritual, if you believe in spiritual nature, whatever, it's economics. If you talk to the poorest, which also makes sense for me, if someone told me, how's your day, and I've lost my job, and I don't know if I'm going to eat something, I'm not going to say I'm doing great, physically, mentally, or emotionally. But we've compartmentalized and siloed individuals into interventions. And data has a huge responsibility, and development partners also have a huge complicity in this. And academia has a huge complicity in this because we work not together. We are threatened and we work in territories, right? It's about, if you see the calls for grants right now, huge emphasis on clinical, on trials, which is important. Don't get me wrong. All of this is important. But if we don't understand the contextual realities of these communities, you're going to spend millions. And it doesn't, it makes somewhat of an impact, but we're not actually addressing some of the issues around how health is understood. So I would say we need to unpack and challenge these data hierarchies and say how some of these data is as relevant. And I think Ortwin and Jamie and Rose may have made this point where development partners have to also open up and say, we need research, longitudinal or even qualitative or ethnographies. We need political scientists and we need social scientists and sociologists to make us understand what COVID is because this pandemic is one of maybe many. There's lots, kind, lots of kinds of disasters happening. And if you look at US, UK, it's disproportionately the minorities or people who are worse off. But we still hold on to a very biomedical model. So data is hierarch, uh, the hierarchy is a very public health biomedical model where access means equality, access means everything's great. You blame the poor because they're not complying. Because we don't want to address some of the deeper issues that impact on people's ability to make choices around their health and well-being. So data in itself is an ecosystem that needs to be unpacked, and we can do it. There's many more interdisciplinary research. I see you cry, I see DFID, I see many other calls now looking at multidisciplinary, but I would say this needs a bit of a huge push because what we're doing is we're undermining communities that we seek. What is our, all our common goals to improve the communities that we seek to serve? Another final thing about data hierarchy is there's a hierarchy within academia. There's a hierarchy within how we as researchers or practitioners see ourselves as the saviors. And we don't really listen or respect the very communities that we seek to serve. Listen, we wouldn't have jobs if we didn't have communities and we didn't do this kind of work. I think a little bit more respect, and I, I, I'm applying this to myself without sounding like a preacher, but after 25 years of working in this, I would say it's very important. Let's start with empathy, respect, and listening. And then you can tackle data hierarchies and all the other kinds of hierarchies that exist invisible, visible in, the, in this ecosystem, which we perpetuate and continue to reproduce. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabina. Wow. Um, that, that was a, um, a, a very satisfying answer, I must say. <laughs> so I've got one for Rose. I've got one for Rose. So this is um, from Naomi Moinga. She says, if physical distancing is prolonged over the next few months, how much longer do we postpone study activities? For example, FGDs and interviews. Studies have limited or time-bound funding. Has anyone had experience keeping up study activities 
even at a lower intensity. So this one is directed at, at Rose in the first instance, and then others can jump in later. So Rose, over to you. Yeah, so I'll just draw from an example of a study that uh, we have uh, actually planned to have it face-to-face, uh, -face, of course, before COVID. And then once COVID happened, we postponed it for one and a half months and realized that we couldn't postpone it anymore. So we had to change the data collection um, methodologies. We moved from face-to-face -face, uh, in-depth interviews to phone interviews, which bring about some of the challenges I talked about. So you can't do a phone interview for one hour. You can only do it for about 20 to 30 minutes before people get tired and they want to move on. But we had to do that. Uh, we had to enlarge the sample, do phone interviews, and of course now bring in experts who do phone interviews because as a research institute, we had never conducted phone interviews. So we had to contract spend more, contract Geopol to do for us phone interviews. And we are now analyzing that data, but we're just struggling with a lot of quality issues. And that's what I was saying, because now you have to move from the interviews you're used to doing to doing phone interviews. And now we're working with somebody else, like a broker who's done for us the interviews. And so engaging them a bit more, understanding some of the challenges, it does bring a lot of quality questions and issues. And for us, it has lengthened now the analysis process. So we have to do a lot more backs and forth. And so what, we, what I would answer, say to this question is that we need to think of other ways of collecting data because as, as the person is saying here, you can't postpone forever, but bear in mind that these newer ways of collecting data are coming with a lot of challenges. Uh, perhaps I should also add that we did phone interviews, but we also did a separate uh, online survey. So people who have smartphones, who have computers, who are able to answer the question on their own, the questionnaire on their own using smartphones. And so we are even struggling of how do we compare that data? Because now the, the people, the, the demographics are very different. You know, it's older people, they're more richer, they are educated, whereas the phone interviews has a co completely different demographic. And so it brings a lot of quality issues and we need to be more thorough on how we handle that. But just saying to this person that it's possible, we need to think of newer ways of collecting data if you can't postpone the study indefinitely because you don't know when COVID-19 will end and we don't want to explore face-to-face -face interviews because you might be putting yourself on the line and, and the people you are interviewing. But think of other ways which is possible, but bear in mind the quality issues. I think we've been struggling with a lot of quality issues using phone interviews and online surveys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Anyone would like to take this one as well? Um, I have a follow-up question, but this one's directed at Sabina. Sabina, you said in, um, that you need to pay people because it's, uh, you know, of, of course people take uh, time out to answer your questions. Um, can you address that? And also, what mechanism do you use? I mean, I struggle with that as well because of the UK regulations. You know, GDPR, you know, I, I can't assess the people's bank accounts. They, they won't let me. So we have to figure out other ways of payments. Um, Sabina, this one's for you. So here we've got the whole Bcash system. Everyone has a mobile phone. One thing we realized early on, we had some meetings across institutions. We have an ethical review board. And we said, we're taking up people's time. So every phone call, we do a flexi load where we do an assessment across institutions, talk to each other and beyond Brack University, say, what would be a fair amount if you're talking to, because many of them are, particularly March, April, May, everyone was at home. We had complete shutdown. And now it's opened up, so people are working. So it's harder to get a hold of people. And we do a flexi load for each phone call with a certain amount of money that we share through our ethical review board. So it's not that hard in terms of bank accounts. People just have this phone number that they set up in Bangladesh to allow for ease of transfer of cash, particularly for disadvantaged groups. So yeah, that made it easier. If you had to go by bank accounts, there'd be a lot of problems. I agree, I agree with you. All right, um, thank you. Anybody else want to jump in? Okay, so let's go to another question. And this is the question from Yolanda Bayuko. She says, what is your experience in localized successes finding its voice at the national level? Anyone who wants to take this one? All right, Otwin? Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's a very interesting topic. I mean, most of the time we see that top-down communication efforts have been released in which the government sets something and then it goes down to the state and then to the community. 
But we have seen, particularly also in Germany, that uh, the state and as well as the federal government has looked at different communities, how they coped with the challenge and then adopted some of this. And I think that was a very interesting part because in the beginning, there was a strong tendency to say we have to be consistent. And it consistent means we have to have the same rules everywhere so that everybody is in fair play. But it's not fair play if some areas have, are hotspot and others are not. So looking at some communities that have had different uh, uh, set of rules, but you know we're very good at that, or we're able to protect, for example, uh, the poorer section of society or the ones that um, are more vulnerable, um, that kind of information was indeed collected and then it came to the state and then to the federal level and then it was partially adopted. And I think learning from the communities and trying to find a pathway to deliver it to the next political level on the vertical governance structure is a very important element. And I hadn't thought about this so much before, but now I think uh, this is also something we need to look much more closely. How can actually the upper levels of hierarchy learn from the lower level, not just the other way around? Sabina, thank you, Autwin. Just very quickly, I was going to say, so it depends on how we define national level or national re responses, because if you look at urban slums, the government still doesn't have an official comprehensive policy for them. But NGOs are providing services, NGOs providing uh, practitioners are very active, and they're living there till there's an eviction. The LGBT population, LGBT population that we work closely with don't have official rights. We inherited the British 377 that penalizes them under the act of sodomy. But the government, I mean, this is the paradoxical situation where what, how do we define national? Because the government in their curriculum, after we worked with them for five years, included homosexuality in the curriculum. So officially and nationally and what that means, there is no linear model. What I find is there's many different stakeholders and some of it is opportunistic, some of it's timely. And who do you go to impact on whom? So the, 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 the LGBT population don't have official rights in the sense they can be criminally prosecuted, right? But on the other hand, which is, yeah, a problem. But on the other hand, they have funding and support. We do research and we do training and many of them are living their lives, but obviously it's sort of a double life, right? Then you've got urban slum populations that are not legally recognized, but NGOs are giving service delivery. Then you've got some issues that are taken at the national level, which is violence against women. And then the laws are not always implemented. So I think we need to be a little bit critical about what we mean and define as national measurements of success. And I would say from my own working experiences that it's a little bit circular, it's a little bit chaotic, it's a little bit kind of opportunistic, and it's different kinds of actors that can inform each other for certain things to happen, maybe at a national level, but sometimes things may not happen at a national level, but there are unintended consequences that are successful for certain marginalized groups. And we have to go with that as we try and work through, you know, if we wait for national responses, I think a lot of us will be waiting a long time in many countries including the US, but I don't, if you get my point, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sabina. Um, right. Uh, here's one for, here's one from um, Yolanda, another one. To Rose, regarding quick studies, we often hear that the criticism of social science studies take time. How do you reason and make the decision makers understand the need for social science research process to take place? Rose, this is for you. So thank you for that. I think uh, decision makers sometimes uh, want very quick answers. And I think COVID-19 is one of those times when they want a lot of quick answers. Um, the conversations we've been having with them, especially that I work with them almost on a day-to-day -day basis, the fact that uh, um, you will need quick answers and sometimes you will need uh, to take time to understand complex situations. And, and for me, COVID-19 is one of those complex situations. And yes, they're looking for quick answers. They're doing a lot of uh, quick knowledge attitudes and, and, and practice surveys, which are being done in a month or two. But those just give us a set of information which is not enough for responding to the challenges that COVID-19 is presenting to communities, especially when it comes to practices. And that is the value of uh, doing more in-depth studies that will take much longer than two months, but in-depth kinds of studies that uh, help you understand the complexities that will speak to, 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 to the challenges in more um, real and practical terms, as opposed to the quick information you capture in a one-month survey, which does not address the root of the issue. So 
I don't think policymakers are opposed to longer term studies. The challenge is usually is actually with, uh, particularly in this situation, they want information right now. That is the challenge. And yet you can't get that information, particularly to complex issues and evolving situations like COVID-19, you need to do some in-depth analysis. Jamie. Thanks. Just a quick one. And can I just respond to the previous question as well? So Mr. Um, partnerships with government are essential if you want to have a national you know, a national response. So involving community involving government with the development of research, you know, having them hold hands throughout the process, you have far more opportunities to have an impact at a national level. Um, everyone's asking them to do that, but but that's it's just essential. Um, in terms of the just from an implementation perspective, in terms of, of, of rapid assessments, which is always a challenge. Um, what helps as, as an implementing organization is not just what the impacts and challenges are on people, which are complex, but you also want to understand what's working and what isn't within the context of the response. And that can be done relatively quickly. Um, if, if I'm trying to respond to communities um, around the biomedical approaches, for example, I want to know what's working and what's not in real time. We can't wait three months to know that. Uh, and that's the more complex issues you're referring to. But, but we need to decide, we need to think about what information we need for what period, time period and then focus on that. Because um, that gets left out very often, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, right, so we, we, we've we been told we've got five minutes left, there are lots of questions. Um, what I would like to do now is call on one or two people to ask their question verbally to, so that to hear other people's voice. Um, I don't know who this initials, H-Y-L. Can you ask your question verbally? You've got a question there. Yeah, Just thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we yeah, can. So I, I actually addressed a question to Ortwin and I just asked for some examples of some transdisciplinary research and interdisciplinary research. Um, I'm, I'm interested in research designs. I, um, I'm, I like Sabina, I'm a critical medical anthropologist, and so I come from that kind of background myself, yes. <laughs> um, but I'm interested in, in examples um, of different kinds of models so that we can, I'm, I'm working on a, a large project right now or a small project, but with a, a diverse team. I have a background in, in, uh, in working on HIV with a variety of funders in Papua New Guinea. So I, I understand the context and this is quite applicable, I think, but I'm interested in what people are doing right now and not necessarily in, um, in the global south. I'm also interested in what's happening in, um, in say the EU in terms of transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary research models. Okay, thank you. Um, who's taking this one? Yeah, I think it was addressed. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm very happy to um, uh, address this. I think just uh, you know, on a just on the um, terminology, transdisciplinary means that we have different disciplines work together on a specific topic. And within the um, uh, COVID-19 crisis, it was that, for example, we had a task force combining epidemiologists, virologists, social scientists, communication specialists. And they were all trying to put together, let's say, the best message that we could send out and even have a kind of a dialogue with others. But these were all kind of scholarly people or people who were really highly um, knowledgeable about a specific discipline, a specific topic, and then they brought their knowledge together. The transdisciplinary is specifically in implementing things. I think that was echoed several times, you need to have the knowledge of those people you want to serve. And whatever the people are, is it just mainstream or women or uh, some marginalized groups, you need to know, I mean, what is the kind of knowledge that they have and also what kind of knowledge is uh, for them, uh, you know, resonates with them. And, and I think that's very important that you include them, not just preach to them, but include them. And of course, it's not that, you know, their knowledge is superior to yours or yours is superior to theirs. They can enrich our knowledge in a sense. So they're not better virologists than the virologist, but they can add something. For example, we can't, and I think this example was given before, we can't afford soap. So what should we do? Or uh, we cannot physically 
socially distanced because we're just living so close together. No way we can do that. So what else can we do? And now we can develop something with them about what is the functionality, the functionality somehow to keep distance and maybe you know wearing masks or something would be a, an equivalent or functional equivalent to that. So in that sense, it's very important to work with the people whom you want to address. And sometimes you also want to work with the social workers that have very good knowledge about some of the practices that people may be shy about telling you um, and uh, about hygiene uh, provisions or something like this. So in that sense, uh, transdisciplinary really means to put in a knowledge of non-scientific actors that have a major impact on the implementation of your policy. And that's what uh, we also try to do. I mean, in Germany, of course, it's not so much in terms of variability than you may have in other countries, but it was very clear that we still have, you know, very poor populations, not as poor as others. They all can afford soap, so that's not an issue. But there were other issues around. And, and there, of course, we have special groups like very young people who believe that they are invulnerable and that, you know, that nothing can happen to them. Also to find a way including their lifestyles, their values, in order to find a good way also to address them and to work with them. But it's very important and that we call transdisciplinary. Well, thank you so much, um, Otwi. Um, we, we don't have time left, unfortunately. Um, so we need to wrap up um, and then Deborah will do a, a um, wrap up with, as a rapporteur. So thank you again, Jamie, Otwi, and Sabina Rose. Thank you all for your excellent questions. And, and now I would like to invite Deb, Deborah Niriyanda from Malawi to uh, present her, her thoughts. Deborah, over to you. Hi, everyone. And thanks, Peck Young, for chairing this. Um, I'll try to give a quick overview of, what, um, of, of our discussions uh, this afternoon. So, our first presenter was uh, Jamie Betson, and uh, one of the key issues that he raised is that the nature of COVID-19 uh, transmission is a little bit complex, and this presents challenges in terms of the messaging around uh, COVID-19 prevention. And this was also kind of like backed up by Otwin when he talked about issues around fake news circulating on COVID-19, and that communication is very important in any response to crisis. And in order for this communication to be effective, we need to pay attention to the context. It needs to be embedded in the context where um, this communication is for it to be relevant. But um, he also talked about issues around paying attention to the semantics of some of the terminologies that we're using to, in order to promote uh, prevention or control of COVID-19. Um, and um, I, one of the key issues that came up from most of the presenters was the issue around uh, focusing on inter interdisciplinary research. And this was stressed so much by Sabina, where he talked about hierarchies in terms of how data is valued and that we, 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 need, we need to value um, like social science data in terms of response to not just the social science data, but we need to, to value uh, the contribution of data from the different disciplines in, for, in order for us to respond uh, to COVID-19. Um, moving forward to Sabina's uh, uh, talk, she talked about um, the standard messages on COVID-19 focusing so much on shutdown and lockdown without really paying attention to the complex realities in the settings where um, in, 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 in some difficult circumstances. So if we don't focus on contextual realities, it becomes um, very hard to, it becomes very hard for people to adopt the interventions. Um, she also, talked about the need to focus on community-centered research and, and not just focus on top-down approaches, but getting communities involved in, in the research that, that, that we're doing. Um, I'll move on to, to, to Rose's presentation and just focus on some of the issues that she talked about. So one of the issues that she talked about was that um, 
COVID-19 has captured so much attention to the extent that all the other health issues are not being focused on, which may lead to other problems if we neglect all the other issues. And um, in as much as there's now increasing priority on communities, it's becoming very hard to engage uh, some hard to reach communities through virtual platforms. They need to be compensated, but then there are also issues around how to compensate for people's time if you're using uh, like, for instance, telephone interviews. She mentioned issues around difficulties to collect data um, using, uh, to, to, to collect good quality data using virtual platforms. And that um, even though actors are interested in quick studies, it's very hard to come up with, uh, with good evidence where people want, um, want the data as, as soon as possible. So to wrap up, I would say that one of the recommendations from, from her was that there's need to sustain funding for non-COVID issues. We need to fund studies focusing on multidisciplinary research and that there's need to support um, governments uh, or national funding mechanisms and national knowledge systems. Thank you. Well, thank you, Deborah right on the dot. Um, and once again, thank you all uh, speakers and participants in our breakout session. And I'll see you back in the main room. Ten seconds. <laughs>